Hey, welcome to Genre Exposure, a film podcast. Join us as we explore the wide world of cinema, broadening our horizons one movie at a time. I'm one of your hosts, Dustin, and as usual, I am here with Jason. Hey, everyone. What's up, my dude? I am doing well. How about yourself? I am also in a state of doing all right. <laughs> we could bitch about our jobs, but no one wants to listen to that. We want to talk about weird movies. Yeah. And oh, do we have a weird one. Yeah. I think we need a uh, to preface this with a <laughs> casual warning. Yeah, so let me set this up. Uh, we're starting a new block. It's the genre exposure summer love. <laughs> And to get into that, we're going back to the world of pink films and all adjacent ideas. And we're going to be talking about Nikatsu's Roman porno series, which heralded them through the 70s and the 80s and was their sort of studio take on the pink film phenomenon. Oh, Dustin's about to school you on on this. Oh, yeah. So I've got the textbook right here beside me. <laughs> sit back and wait. We'll get on to that. But uh, today we are talking about Zoom Up Rape Sight from 1979. I thought it was Murder Sight. Directed by Koyu Ohara. I think I watched the wrong movie. Um, now, if you go looking to purchase this movie, because you can, and we'll get into all of that, you will see it labeled as Zoom Up Murder Sight, and that's also how I have labeled the film on social media, because I learned <laughs> that when you put rape in your posts on social media, uh, it doesn't really work out that well for you, and instead of having to remake all our posts two times to see if they get flagged or not, I thought I would just play it safe. Yeah, I think that's the wise thing to do. Um, so, Disclaimer. Pink films are erotic cinema. If you're not cool with that, you know, just know that going in. Um, particularly this film, Zoom Up, Rape Site. It uh, yeah, they could be quite transgressive. It goes quite transgressive, quite extreme. Um, obviously, it's right there in the title. Although I will say, I, I didn't. I know this is an early example too, but it didn't go quite as extreme as I was anticipating. Mm. This started. A lot of stuff. So. Yeah, I have no doubt. Um, they had to raise the bar from here. And when you realize where here is, and then you have to go harder. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, usual thing applies. Uh, know your limits. Know what you're cool with. Mm -hmm. If you're like, I don't, I don't even like step into the world of erotic cinema. That's not my bag. It's not my thing. I don't want to get into that. Right. Especially weird ones that are mixing up like horror and violence in the mix too. Yes. Uh, that's cool, man. If you just want to sit here and listen to us do the first part and talk about what we've been watching and then just be like, whatever, fuck the movie. Or if you're just like, hey, I need a good like two month break from your show to catch up on some other stuff. Yeah, we will not be hurt. No, nope. we we will respect it. <laughs> we will understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, that being said, for everyone else, buckle the fuck up. Mm -hmm. and we're gonna get into it, but of course, always as usual, we are gonna start with talking about movies we've watched and a little little preamble thing. And I think the obvious thing to talk about this time is, unfortunately, William Friedkin has passed away. Yes. Kind of a divisive figure, mm -hmm. you know, especially recently when a lot of his more aggressive tendencies have really come to light and how mm -hmm. he was kind of, you know, abusive and manipulative and everything like that. Yeah. Which is all true. I mean, mm -hmm. he could be a son of a bitch, no <laughs> doubt. But oh my God, what a genius fucking director. One of the greats of all time, you as know. far as film directors. Um, and, you know, the obvious thing that's relevant to us, there's two predominantly, and that is The Exorcist, of course, one of like those landmark horror films. Just greatest of all time. Absolutely. Um, you know, on the way over, I was thinking of a joke about like, oh, he saw the trailer for Exorcist Believer mm -hmm. and just like gave up on existence. Yeah. But yeah. I was like, eh, I'll, I'll leave that to like the internet to make that joke. <laughs> um, it's kind of low hanging fruit. Really. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the Exorcist is great. I think like if you had put a gun to my head and was like, you have to name me what you think is the scariest movie of all time. That would be like one of the contenders. Oh, I think, no doubt. To, no doubt. If I had to only pick one and just like commit to it. Um, and there's always, you know, people that say like, Oh, it's not scary at all because I'm an atheist and I don't believe in God. So That's bullshit. there's no difference. It's like, um, we've talked about it a lot on the show. Like, you know, horror films can be like metaphors for things and let you approach like difficult ideas through a fantasy, uh, lens. And mm -hmm. so, like, really the core of that, as far as the horror, is, like, you have a loved one, and that loved one has something wrong with them, yeah. and you can't help them. Nothing you can do can make right. it better or fix it. Substitute possession, you know, substitute mental illness for possession, mm -hmm. you know. Um, doctors don't have an answer. No one has an answer. And you just have to watch them suffer and wish you could do something. And, like, that's the horror of that film, right. really. Right, right. It's a very mature adult horror. It's mm -hmm. not about the cussing and the gore right. and shit like that. Also... You're an atheist, so devil movies don't scare you? <laughs> Fuck you, all right? Oh, then why do you love vampire movies and zombie films and shit? You know, it's all supernatural. So, Fuck you. <laughs> this is one of my favorite, uh, like, internet movie 
gathering site arguments is that one and then the whole like oh well i don't like ghost movies because ghosts aren't real so this just doesn't scare me <laughs> it's like oh come on dude yeah that's ridiculous um and then the other one of course it's you may be even more relevant to our show is sorcerer near and just, dear to this podcast yes it was our first successful episode you might say <laughs> such a classic um, film and just super classic and i saw the um the little like tweet from stephen king where he was like you know um He'll be remembered forever for The Exorcist, but if you ask me, his masterpiece was Sorcerer, which is that's yeah, good that's, argument. That's yeah. an argument, yeah. And don't forget the French Connection. Don't oh, forget yeah. uh, Cruising. Oh, that's, under, under I love. Movie. I fucking yeah. love Cruising. Yeah, he really contributed a lot to like many different genres, mm-hmm. even beyond horror. Uh, to live and die in L.A. Mm. Great crime action film. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Uh, so yeah, I mean, he'll be missed. Yeah, so controversial dude. Like like everyone, there's ups and downs to a person mm-hmm. in their life and the things they've done. But I mean, let's let's be honest. All creative geniuses are mostly dicks. You know? <laughs> it's just the way it is. So yeah, man. Rest in peace. Yep. That being said, what have you been watching? Well, the big one I should talk about, pun intended, is Oppenheimer. <laughs> okay. Uh, of course, Christopher Nolan's new film. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's a masterpiece. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know you were dubious. <laughs> I, I don't know why you doubt. I just... And I'm not... I, I, I do really love Nolan, but I do... I can admit it when he's made a bad movie. Mm. Like, Dark Knight Rises... Didn't oh, I really, even like that. ...didn't work for me that much. Hmm. Um, I think it really got kind of lost in itself. Um, but most of his movies are damn good, if not masterpieces. Inception... I think is a masterpiece. I think Tenet is. Tenet, oh my god, Tenet. Yeah. Um, and Oppenheimer's right up there. It, it's, it's it's brilliant. The acting is brilliant. Cinematography, everything. I mean, everything you would expect to be brilliant. Is did, you, uh, brilliant. did you go for the true experience and get the front row IMAX seat? Uh, well, it wasn't the front row. <laughs> and it wasn't a real IMAX. It was an IMAX in, in Lexington, which isn't a real yeah, IMAX. How far would we even have to drive to get like... One we have to go at things? least three hours. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, yeah. So it wasn't like a 70 millimeter IMAX like I would have liked, but Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it was still good. Impressive. (laughs) Uh, yeah. I mean, if you haven't seen it, go see it. It it really is something you should see in the theater, even if it's not the right aspect ratio. So in the scope of the grand clash, Barbie and Oppenheimer, which one? Oh, Oppenheimer. Definitely. (laughs) I mean, Barbie is a fun movie. I like it a lot, but I mean, the gauntlet has been thrown. Oppenheimer is cinema, you know? So, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Killian Murphy will win an Oscar, and so will Robert Downey Jr. I'm saying that. I'm going on record right now saying okay. that. He's committed to it. Mm-hmm. Right, watch the space. We'll yep. See what happens. And Nolan will probably get Best Director. Huh. I mean, it is an oscar rate film, so. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really, so any well-made, important film is oscar bait automatically. No, no, I think... The, the, I'll, I'll, I'll share this here. This is like my hangups about wanting to go see this movie is that I feel sometimes there are these movies and when you see it, you just like, no, like this was made to try to win an Oscar. And it's often when it's like about a historical thing. And those are the ones that typically do win Oscars. Yeah. Yes. Now, whether or not no one's really trying to win one, I'm sure he would like one. I mean, why wouldn't he? But I mean, and I would argue that almost every movie he's made, he could have conceivably won an Oscar for it mm-hmm. because I mean, they're all just so fucking good. Uh, and then my other thing, and I think I made this argument to you off air, but it was like when I think about the whole idea of like nuclear bomb and all that kind of stuff, like I want to remember it the way that David Lynch portrayed it, where in Twin Peaks The Return, it birthed the excess of evil into the world yes. and changed things forever. Well, sure. The the sequence with the bomb in Oppenheimer <laughs> is amazing. It's very well done. It's fantastic. But yeah, Lynch now owns that moment. Mm-hmm. His, his interpretation of that was just pure fucking genius. <laughs> but anyway, okay. So if Nolan has lost out to Lynch in that, okay. <laughs> if, if you got to lose to someone, it may as well be Lynch. Okay. <laughs> On the opposite end of the spectrum, <laughs> like the very opposite end, and I, I may I may owe Muck an apology. So I think I found a worse movie. Oh. Uh, the Barn Part Two. Um, this came out not too. I've almost ago. watched the barn several times. I, I saw the barn when it came out. I don't really remember it. <laughs> I know I saw it. Um, is there a is there a barniverse? 
Is there like an expansion of films? Are there other people out there just making shitty horror cinematic universes? <laughs> I'm, yeah, I think so. Um, but yeah, it's just, man, I mean, I think their heart's in the right place. But it's one of those movies that its sole purpose is to, it's that fake nostalgia. It's mm. like, hey, remember what the 80s and early 90s were like? You know, I remember renting video cassettes of all these trashy horror flicks. Hey, sure. remember these stars you used to love? They're old and washed up now, but we've got them in this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, it's played out, man. That is so fucking played out. Yeah, what was the one movie? Was it, I never even watched it. Was it Death House or, it was the one that was like, oh, this is the Expendables of Horror movies. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah I don't know what you're talking about. I don't even know what came of that. But, I mean, and, and this is also one of those movies that it's almost like, critic proof because it, it doesn't matter if it's bad because they'll just say well we made it to be bad as opposed yeah. to be it's an homage to those bad directed video movies mm-hmm. but that's not you know fuck that no it's very flat which they could say okay yeah that's how they looked back then but it's like <laughs> I guess none of their sets were longer than 10 feet because oh. everything is claustrophobic and everything is like a medium shot or close up on someone or something so it's obvious they're in the same room over mm. and over and over. <laughs> so they, they didn't happen to just own a house somewhere, like with Kill Her Goats, that they could just go and just right. use the whole property. No, they just had some run-down barn somewhere. Okay. And it has all these appearances. It's got Linnea Quigley in it, Lloyd Kaufman, Joe Bob Briggs. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ari Lehman. <sighs> so avoid it. Cool. And as much as I love that era and those kinds of movies, mm. it's just... You know, it's done. Just stop it. Do something. We need to start a new era. We need to start our own new wave of horror. And I think maybe A24 has done that. Mm -hmm. Um, Just not everyone's wanting to hop on that boat. Right. Right. But Mm -hmm. enough of the retro (laughs) looking in the past. Yeah. We've got to start looking to the future and make something new. That's my two cents. Man, you're throwing a lot of gauntlets down today. (laughs) I am, man. (laughs) I got a bug up my ass. (laughs) Okay, well... um. I wanted to cycle back to some stuff I watched. Uh, it was a little bit ago now, but I never talked about them, and it seemed thematically appropriate since we're in the world of erotic cinema now. <laughs> um, I continued my sojourn with checking out all the Emmanuel in Space films. Oh. <laughs> so uh, I watched the second one, Emmanuel in Space 2, A World of Desire. Uh-huh. So this uh, this takes us right back in. Of course, it's basically like a TV show as movies again, so it's the, the serialized ongoing adventures of Emmanuel... And these aliens that have come to learn about uh, sex and human reproduction and romance and... Emmanuel is the one to teach them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's got to be. She knows all about it. Um, And so in the first film, of course, they kind of made first contact and she agreed to help them. Um, And surprisingly, the second one I thought was kind of better in a lot of ways. If you remember, my biggest criticism of the first one was it was kind of just like three 30-minute episodes that were completely unrelated. And they sort of just threaded them together. Mm -hmm. Um. So this one, it's still like there were still like three thirty-minute parts that were in distinct setup locations, but there was like this through line in the plot that chained them all. That actually kind of it didn't feel so obviously like here's episode one, here's episode two, here's episode three. Like like the crypt keeper telling you a story or something. Uh-huh, like. Yeah, and so it started how you might expect. Um, Emmanuel's trying to show them what porn is and pornographic content. Mm. And they're sort of like monitoring their reactions. And they notice that curiously there's one guy in the group who's like, I don't feel anything from any of this. It just yeah, it doesn't work whatever, for doesn't work for me. And so she decides to take him on a field trip down to the planet to explore that possibility. Mm-hmm. Um, which turns out to be that just apparently he just needs to really be like emotionally attached to the person. Uh, to get any kind guys. of arousal. So <laughs> um, she takes him to like, it's what this a, weird like... Beta older playboy dude that kind of does like sexy fashion shoots and stuff and for no reason he has a mansion full of like servants that like sexually gratify people right there's a reason for it (laughs) um and so her plan is just to like get him to hook up with a bunch of people Mm -hmm. and they they do the whole like spiel they send in like the the sexy like french maid girl to come on to him and he's he's just not into it you know okay and then as they're hanging out there he notices like one of the, the stable hands that tends to the horses that this crazy rich guy owns. He falls in love with her. Okay. And so that becomes this whole, like he, he understands, he gets it all now, but he decides he doesn't want to go back to the ship, which they've already set up as like the primary thing is they can't abandon the mission. They have to stay in the ship as much as possible. Sure. 
their, their plan is not to stay on Earth. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it sets off this series of chaining events where he runs away and goes rogue. And the captain of the crew, Hafron, who was the, the person that initially hooked up with Emmanuel, mm-hmm. she, they, the two of them kind of get in this whole thing about, like, Emmanuel's like, we should let this play out. And he's like, no, we have to capture and bring him back in. And so they pursue him across several different regions, trying to uh, bring him back in and, like, bickering about what to do on the situation. Okay. Uh, completely ridiculous. We get a weird visit to, like, a monastery where they get into some weird, like, tantric <laughs> sex stuff. What was it Kessel Anthrax? <laughs> um, and, and then there's a whole part where they go to, like, a street festival. Um, and, and we get a major plot development where Emmanuel hooks up with this other dude, and Hafron realizes he's jealous. Ooh. See, he's so, emotionally So there's some, some emotions developing between the two of them. Um, still ridiculous, still completely dumb, but so dumb it's funny. Mm-hmm. Still the, like, one critical sex scene per episode, and it's pretty much like they have a set location, and then they have the camera on that track just spinning in a circle around the action as it goes down. Weird. Completely goofy. Hmm. Um, but more enjoyable, so I'll, I'll give it that. That's good. My other watch mm-hmm. is another weird from the 90s softcore erotic series that I stumbled upon. <laughs> You're in the mood lately, aren't you? I just... So after after the Emmanuel thing, which by the way, the Black Emmanuel box set came out, and I got it in this week, and it's fucking like one of the best design box sets I've ever seen. Cool. So. Now, now some of those are interesting, mm-hmm. are genuinely fun. Um, if you are a film collector, that's like go to Sever and check that out. That's like one thing you ought to pick up. Cool. It's worth having in your collection. Nice. Um, but no, no, I was I think I was trolling like Grindhouse Video, which is a good online retailer for mm-hmm. you know picking up movies and stuff, and they have like a whole clearance bin of stuff that's marked down. And so I stumbled on this series of DVDs for a series called Justine. Hmm. And it's the same deal as like the manual in space. They were made for TV. They're like hour and a half movies that are kind of like segments merged together. So it's in relation to the Marquis de Sade, Justine? No. Okay. Um, and it's, I, don't, I didn't bother to research this because I didn't think I would even bring it up. But <laughs> on the DVD, they had all this extra feature stuff about Roger Corman. But he wasn't in the credits, so I don't know if he, like, worked on these under another name or, like, he helped somehow get these made or what was yeah. going on, but... Maybe it was, like, his production company or something. No telling. There's no telling. Um, so I checked out the first one of several, uh, Justine in the Heat of Passion. And so the whole hook of all of this is that it's a, like, uh, girls' college, and we have our main character, Justine, played by Danine Boone. Very attractive lady. I don't think she did much more than a bunch of softcore films, so not really going to find her out there anywhere. But um, So she's a student there, and she is in a sort of like archaeology course, and she has a major crush on her professor, Professor Robson. Well, I think they pronounce it like Robson, but... Oh, yeah, it was New Horizons video. That was Roger Corman's. Mm, there we go. Okay. Nice support on that. No problem. Um, and so the whole hook is that she's in love with him, but of course he's you know, a professor at the college, so he would never never dare to fool around with any of the students. And Justine loves to daydream. And so the ridiculously dull premise of this is that you'll be at the school, something will happen, then Justine will kind of have a daydream, and it cuts to like show you the fantasy played out, and then eventually like cuts back in to normal life. And, like, nothing really happened because it was just in her mind. Okay. Um, not as, like, goofily stupid as Emmanuel in space. So, I on premise alone, I was like, oh, this is going to be, like, a dumb, like, sexy Indiana Jones or something. But it's really not. It's really dry. It's really dull. Um, I don't even know what else I want to say about it because it was, yeah, it was just not very interesting. Hmm. That's too bad. No. Oh, yeah, she's very attractive. She is. Um, the first segment was, like, this whole thing about, like, he was talking about an artifact in class, and then she had this whole daydream of, like, they go to Egypt on an expedition to open this tomb. And there's, like, former Nazis also trying to get the Whoa, artifact. Whoa, Nazis, and, and it's boring? Yeah. It, it huh. really is, there's just no action. It's very dull dialogue. It's unfortunate. Um, Pretty steamy sex scenes, though, got to yeah. be honest. I guess that's really the point yeah. of the show, I guess. So. I, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and then the second one is um, it's kind of a follow-up of that, where she imagines that the, the main Nazi bad guy like follows them back to America, 
and tries to abduct Justine in a plot to draw Professor Robeson, mm-hmm. and they're like supposed to be rivals or from way back or something. And um, that's my next character in Cthulhu or something, <laughs> Professor <you>? Robeson. <laughs> He's a pretty dashing looking guy too. All right. And then the third one was this whole daydream about some sort of like, I want to say like Inuit artifact or something. And it was like lost and they were going to recover it. And there was different factions that someone wanted to steal it to sell it for money and turn against their. So it's like a cheap erotic Indiana Jones. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. But it's all fake and in her daydreams and right. it cuts back and nothing has happened. And it's just like, Oh, Oh, <laughs> oh Justine, you're such a daydreamer. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Why didn't they actually make it like real? Like I don't know. And then the other thing is, and I guess it's because it's her daydreams. Like Justine never does anything. Like all the sex scenes are like other people doing mm-hmm. things. Really? Yeah. Oh, she gets off on watching. I mean, you know, and like every time it'll be like she's put in like peril. Like in the, in the middle part when the Nazi dude abducts her, he's like, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna deflower you. I'm gonna turn you into a woman. I'm gonna make you my slave." Da da da. da. And like he ties her up. And then, like, she gets saved before anything happens. Like, every time, it's like, she'll put her in, like, this weird peril of, like, oh, no, what are you going to do to me? And then it's like, I don't, I don't hey, know. Everybody's got their own fantasy. Listen, I'm not saying know? I wanted that to happen. I just thought, like... <laughs> sure. I don't know. It, it was just weird. <laughs> she gets off on being denied. What? I mean, you know. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to see in the movie coming up that some people have some strange <laughs> desires. They do. And maybe... Maybe the watching of pink films has warped me beyond appreciation of this. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen these and you appreciate them. Right in, tell me what what was what, what is their appeal? Because I don't I don't mm-hmm. understand. Mm-hmm. Other than there's attractive ladies in it, I guess. I think but, that is the appeal. <laughs> I think you're looking for too much meaning in something. I don't know. <laughs> Emmanuel in space was so funny. Like I, wa- I wanted that again, and I thought it was going to be that couched in like an Indiana Jones riff. But I don't know. Maybe they get better. Right, the first Emmanuel in space. Yeah, it, it improved from. Keep trying, yeah. see what happens. Well, I, I kind of got to because I just they had them all on clearance. I just bought all like of six. Or, I bought all six or seven of them. So of course you did. You're pot committed now. Yeah, I got, I got money down on this man. So we'll see. Maybe I'll check back in after I've seen a few. Yeah, let us know. Okay. God damn. <laughs> All right, so today we are talking about Zoom Up Rape Site from 1979, directed by Koyu Ohara, who's a bit of a legend in this whole Nakatsu Roman porno thing. He's got a lot of titles under his name, a lot of, I guess, like prominent ones that have started different series or are really well known. Is he considered the king of <clears throat> Roman porno? I don't know if he's the king, but I guess you could say he's one of the greats. He's definitely royalty. <laughs> Daniel, um, maybe. Right off the top, I guess I'll hit you with a synopsis. A young couple meeting for a tryst at the site of a brutal murder witness another murder and have to decide whether to turn the killer in. Oh, that actually sounds like a good story. It does. So, I guess where I want to start is, what genre is this? We'll start there before we go back. Well, looking here at the Grindhouse Cinema Database... It says it's a crime drama horror film. Mm-hmm. IMDb says that as well. I mean, I would throw sex in there too. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it, it, it is also an erotic film. <laughs> right. It's... So an erotic crime drama horror. Mm. Thriller, even. You could throw that in. There's definitely thriller elements. Yeah. Um, if you squint hard, it could be a giallo. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, there's definitely some giallo-esque elements in this film. Yeah. Um, which we'll get into, of course. And then, of course, you could apply the label pink film. Would you be correct in doing that? It depends on who you talk to. Because mm-hmm. I think um, if we want to go back to that, first I'm going to say we're not going to do a lot on the history of pink film in this episode. If you're curious about that at all and you're newer and you haven't gone through all our episodes, cycle back to our first year. I want to say it was like what was like episode five or six. It was really one of the early ones. We yeah. covered um, Inflatable Sex Doll of the Wastelands. Mm-hmm killer film really loved it for some reason it has the most views on youtube of all of our <laughs> i think it's just people trying to find videos of inflatable sex dolls um they but, were sorely disappointed 
But speaking of episodes that are important for us, that was the first one where we tried the whole, like, I'm going to do a whole bunch of research and, like, break down a genre for people and mm-hmm. give a history and stuff. Yes. Um, and I still think it was probably one of the better ones I ever did. No, oh, yeah. So if you are completely new to Pink Films as an idea and a concept at all, go there. You can get some history. You can get oriented. Um, and you can also learn about a book, which I have here right beside me, that I did use as reference for this episode. Behind the Pink Curtain, The Complete History of Japanese Sex Cinema by one of my favorite film critics of all time, Jasper Sharp. Or I believe, as Michael put it, old Jasper. <laughs> Hello, Jasper. <laughs> For some reason. <laughs> um, this is like the ultimate Bible, if you're interested in Japanese erotic cinema, I would say. Um, it's huge, it's very comprehensive, and it will orient you on everything you need to know. Nice. I do think it's currently out of print. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was noticing that... It looked like you couldn't just like go buy it at Amazon anymore. It was mm. kind of like jacked up in price. So hopefully, I don't know, maybe there'll be like another reprint or maybe they'll even do a new edition. And or at least maybe a digital edition. Or something. Include maybe more films because, of course, there are still more pink films rolling out. Download it on your Kindle. <laughs> That'd be cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, which I've got a little passage I want to read from this, but we'll get to that later. So okay. all I want to define about pink films is just that they are independently made erotic cinema in Japan. Now the big delineating thing there is independent. Mm -hmm. After this kind of boomed and took off, a lot of the major studios wanted a piece of the pie. And so you have companies like Nakatsu, like Toei that looked at this and said, Hey, we can just funnel a little bit of money. That's more than what the Indies are playing with. We can do the exact same thing and we can rake in tons of cash. Yep. And so with Nakatsu, that was their Roman porno series Toei, famously, they have the Pinky Violence series, which has some very iconic films like Female Prisoner Scorpion Mm. or a personal favorite of mine, Zero Woman Red Handcuffs, which is getting a restoration release from, uh, I want to say Neon Eagle, I think, the one's doing it. I'll I'll throw it in the show notes because that's that's one to look out for. Nice. So, before we go into this film, I guess let's talk about Nakatsu a little bit. Okay. Let me, let me orient us on that. So, uh, with the rising success of Pink Films, in 1971, the president of Nakatsu, Takashi Itamochi, decided that they needed to get in on this game. At the time, their company wasn't doing the greatest. They were losing a lot of money. They were not the most financially sound. So, you know, the same way that uh, horror had its booms here in the West because it was easy to funnel money into that and turn a profit. Mm -hmm. That exact same formula played out again. So um, same as Toei, they had done previous films before this in the sort of like sexploitation market. Uh, Some notable ones are Story of Heresy and Meiji Era from 1968 and Tokyo Bathhouse also from 1968. Um. But this series is when they really ramped up and leaned into this whole genre. And they moved into starting on it at the early part of 71. And then in November 1971, the Roman porno series officially launched with Apartment Wife, Affair in the Afternoon. Which, first thing you'll learn as you go into these is these have amazing fucking titles. Yeah, yeah. They're also usually very on the nose about whatever they're going to be about. (laughs) Um... And that starred Kazuko Shirakawa, who went on to become very prominent in the series and was cast in a lot of films. Um, The movie was a huge, huge hit, and they went on to make 20 more Apartment Wife films. Wow. Now, not all interconnected or anything, but, you know, it was like a thematic series, which you'll you'll learn as we talk about this more. That was kind of their thing they leaned into. Um, This one that we're doing today, it launched a whole series of films titled Zoom Up. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about why that title exists too. But, okay. um, and so, yeah, um, Shirakawa got dubbed as Nakatsu's first queen of uh, Rowan Porno. Um, a little bit just about the whole concept. Um, director Masaru Konuma said that the process of making a Roman Porno was pretty much identical to the work of making a pink film, except thanks to being in the studio system, they got to play with a higher budget. Uh, Nakatsu continued making these higher quality pink films almost exclusively at an average rate of three per month. And they continued that for the next 17 years, (laughs) Jesus, which is insane. 
Um, Nakatsu gave its directors for this series a great deal of artistic freedom in making their films. All they had to do was follow a few guidelines and hit some little quotas. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the famous quotas that often gets brought up and talked about is that if the film's an hour, it needs to have had four nude or sex scenes that are very distinct and take up a passage of the film. Mm -hmm. Sounds reasonable. Uh, Some of the other rules, a lot of people said there was three simple rules, and that is that... um, you should try to have a scene of simulated sex occur approximately every 10 minutes. Um, the movie should be shot on as low a budget as possible. Mm-hmm. And it should be from starting to shoot to finish and completely wrapped, take place in a week. Wow. So when you look at those parameters, that's how they were churning out you know, three per month for so mm-hmm. many years. I mean, a week's a pretty short you know, shoot time. Yeah. But because of that, other than you've got the premise and you do these things, they really didn't care what their directors did. As long as when they turned it in, it checked all those boxes. Nice. And that's where, if, if you come at this and you're like, why, why do these films matter? Why should we be interested in them? Isn't it basically just softcore porn? Because of this whole setup, people were able to do like interesting ideas. And if you're an up-and-coming director, it was a way that you could experiment and try things and kind of develop your craft and it was, you know, there was no risk involved. There was no, oh, if I fuck this up somehow, that's the end of my career. Yeah, right. Oh. So these aren't really like the um, soft uh, core porn movies you would watch on Cinemax late at no. night. When, you know. <laughs> uh, they weren't made just to fill airtime. These right. were these were actually like ridiculously profitable, and everybody was trying to get a piece of the pie. And still, for the most part, trying to be somewhat creative. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the result of these rolling out, they became incredibly popular both with audiences and surprisingly with critics. Uh, once the Roman porno series began, it usually had one or two films appearing on top ten lists by Japanese critics every year. Hmm. So that's another interesting switch, because if we are kind of making that comparison to the like made-for-TV erotic <laughs> films over here, like... No one's like lauding those or putting those on like lists for... Yeah. yeah. Unless it's a list only about that. Right. Yeah. Um, and so then this series essentially took away from the pink film market and kind of made it a little tougher for the smaller independent studios to, uh, stay in the game. And that continued until the mid 1980s where there was a huge shift in general. And that gets into where we kind of would want to talk about the whole like bubble economy of the eighties in Japan Mm -hmm. and how much influence that had. But we talked about that in that prior episode. So again, if you need context on that, Go back there, listen to that. And the advent of video had to be a game changer, too. Mm. And, and that was the key to it. The, yeah. the big thing was the rise of the adult video industry, which began to pull away from the pink film clientele. Because for a lot of people, if you are only coming these for the erotic content, yeah. and you don't care about filmmaking or anything like cinema-related right. adult videos, that's going to get you to what you're wanting much faster. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I also wanted to throw in a note here, just because we've mentioned this in the past... If you're interested in that whole shift of the rise of the adult video industry in Japan and how that impacted so many different markets in society, um, there's a good Netflix series called The Naked Director. And it is a fictionalized, sort of semi-quasi-truthful historical document of a very famous Japanese adult video director, Toru Muranishi. Hmm. And I think it's two seasons, and it kind of chronicles his rise from being a nobody to having the most popular adult video company in Japan. Cool. And how it all kind of fell apart eventually. So you were lauding something on Netflix. Wow. Yes. Oh my gosh. Um, I'm pretty sure it was one of those things where they just grabbed some people in Japan and threw them some money and said, hey, make something. Yeah, they put Netflix original on the yeah. front of it. Yep. Um, well, one thing we should do, I guess, before we go much further, let's define this title, this, this idea of Roman porno. Okay. Uh, we did mention it at the end of last episode, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, generally that's thought of to mean that it's saying romantic pornography. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is where I wanted to dive into Behind the Meat Curtain and read this little passage because uh, Jasper kind of gives a little bit more context on that whole naming scheme. So, Old Jasper. Old Jasper. Uh, he wrote, It is often claimed that the label is a contraction made from the word romantic pornography. A more convincing explanation is that it was derived from the French term roman pornographique or pornographic novel. This was used to describe erotic fictional works ranging from the writings of the Marquis de Sade to Pauline 
Riaj, the story of O, and Anais Nin's Delta of Venus. The association with the world of European literature, albeit its more carnal side, was intended to lend Nakatsu's adult output a sort of more highbrow cachet compared to with its less reputable rivals in what was considered the eruduction genre. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Um, so what Nakatsu essentially did was to dramatically bring sexual subject matter out from the underground, dust it down and repackage it in what was supposed to be like, this is intended for wider audiences. This is more acceptable. This isn't just a softcore porn. This mm-hmm. is roman porno. Oh. Very classy. Yeah. Interesting. So I think that context helps a little bit. Yes. So rolling on, um, as a series, it was famed for also having many different genres and sub-series that it got into. So to kind of get into some of those, um, Tatsumi Kumashiro was one of their major directors, and he had a huge string of financial and critical hits that was unprecedented at the time in Japanese cinematic history. Some of this includes, uh, from 1972, Ichijo's Wet Desire. <laughs> from 1979, Woman with Red Hair, uh, which starred Junko Miyashita, who was another one of their, like, queens of Roman porno. Um, and, oh, yes, oh, so this is, I knew I had, when you were talking about, like, the king of Roman porno, um, Kumashiro, he was the one that got that title, uh-huh. being considered the king okay. of the genre. Uh, some other notable people, we have Noboru Tanaka, who directed A Woman Called Sada Abe from 1975. Um, by many critics in Japan, and like they're actually like analyzing these films, he's often considered to be one of the very best. Um, so as far as subgenres, uh, one of their very prominent ones was they had a whole series of S&M-focused films. And that got established in 1974 with the legendary Flower and Snake, mm. which is also based on a classic novel that dates back even further. Um, and then the star of that film, Naomi Tani, she was another one of their big uh, film queens for this whole series. And it was so popular, they just immediately were like, hey, we need more films like this. Grab all the rope you can. <laughs> you <know? laughs> we um, need more red cord now. Yeah. Um, um, and then Tani herself was also in other films by some other directors like Shogoro Nishimura, that led to some classic titles like Rope Cosmetology from 1978. <laughs> uh, a few other, not as big as that genre, but other ones within this series, you've got the what was called Violent Pink, which was established in 1976 by Yasuhara Hasebe. Um, and of that sort of like, quote, Violent Pink series, the, the idea of that was you were mixing up the elements of a pink film with more violent, exploitative movies like crime films or horror or things like that. Okay. And so that is technically what this film we're talking about today would be considered. Yes. Um, and, and so, like, you know, everything is good, everything's booming, everything's big. And so with the rise of home video, with the rise of VCR, the rise of adult video, that began to tear everything down. And so as early as 1982, um, the AV industry had already attained an approximately equal share of all adult entertainment market compared to theatrical erotic films. Things got more complicated in 1984 as the government rolled out new censorship policies. They made an agreement with Aaron, the Japanese film rating board, uh, which I think I didn't think we went into deeper detail on that in the mm-hmm. prior episode as well. Um, and so this put a lot of pressure on the big studios to comply with these new changes, and that made it harder for them to make these films. And as a result, a month after that ruling rolled out, Profits on their pink films dropped by 36% okay, yes. compared to what they had been doing. Damn. Um, and this ramped up only further in 1988 when Aaron dealt a serious blow to the industry by making even stricter requirements on the depiction of sex in theatrical films. And it was in response to this and their declining sales and profits that Nakatsu responded by discontinuing the Roman Porno series. Hmm. Um, the final film of this crazy 17-year... Escapade was 1988's Bed Partner. All right. Um, now, in the wake of this, Nakatsu continued to distribute films under the name Roponica, and they did still make some pink film inspired works, which they released under Excess Films. However, whatever magic they had captured and just rolled on for all that time, 
it was lost. Okay. Those films never really did that well, never made that much. They kind of had their diehards that just loved it, that would always seek it out. Probably would have been people like us, I'm sure, mm-hmm. if we, we were there at the time. But oh. uh, it just it wasn't a thing anymore. It was the the magic had faded somehow. Um, and so at the end of the 80s, rolling into the 90s, adult video had become the main form of adult cinematic entertainment in Japan. Um, now the one side benefit of this is the actual independent pink films. They were kind of able to reclaim their audience some because they didn't have this big competition anymore. Right. Um, so in the wake of that, that started to ramp up more and actually get the focus it probably deserved from the start before the studios got in the mix. Nice. Um, and so what happened to Nakatsu, right? Mm-hmm. Despite being the largest producer of pink films during the 70s and 80s, they ended up filing for bankruptcy protection in 1993. Wow. That sucks. Yep. And in the wake of that, while they were able to ultimately stabilize, and they are still around today, and they are still putting out films, it took a very long time before the words Roman porno ever escaped the company again. And it wasn't until 2016, when for the 45th anniversary of the launch of everything, they decided they were going to do some new Roman porno to kind of just be a little throwback and, mm-hmm. and show some love to their, their history and everything they went through. Um, which they rolled that out with five titles. And then more recently in 2022, they did a second wave with three more titles. Now they used direct video or they actually get in theatrical play? Uh, I believe they did get theatrical release. Yeah. Um, now the interesting thing is some of these were remakes where they looked back at some, what were some of the most popular ones we ever had? Mm -hmm. And they were bringing in like fresh talent to do like a modern interpretation of it. And then some of the other ones was just, we want to grab like prominent directors that have some kind of clout or a following or an interest and say, you know, Hey, we'll, we'll put up the money for this. Make us a Roman porno. We want to see what you would do. Um, and the interesting ones are really those ones where they just threw money at someone and let them go because they kind of took a more contemporary approach. And a lot of the movies that came out of that kind of moved away from what you would say, maybe some of the more misogynistic elements that crowd into a lot of these films and kind of, gave you different perspectives more more let's look at like one of these from a woman's perspective directly yeah. instead of just you know the male perspective right um and i guess the final thing to cap off on this is some notable directors that we talk about a lot on the show actually got in the mix on this revival uh most notably my favorite director shion sono he made anti-porno which i would definitely love to do an episode about one day um but other notables we've got hideo nakata who made white lily hmm. and then Probably, probably the goat of genre exposure. The one, the only, the found footage master, Koji Shiraishi, made a film for them, Safe Word. Okay. Have you seen those? I've seen Anti-Porno. I don't know if you can easily get at the rest. Mm. Doesn't usually stop you. Anti-Porno managed to <laughs> land a Blu-ray release, I want to say by Third Window Films, when uh-huh. they were kind of churning out all his recent output. But, uh, I mean, there might be, like, copies online floating sure. out there. I've never gone to search for them. Okay. Hmm. So yeah, that's that's the uh, whirlwind run through Roman porno. Very nice. Now let me lay down just a little background for our film, and then we will stop teasing and get into the action, <laughs> one might say. <laughs> uh, this was the first film in what became known as Nakatsu Zoom Up series. Because it was so successful, they decided to make more films using the same motif and ideas. It also represented a return to the ultra-violent, misogynistic the violent pink style, which had been heavier in their earlier output, but Nakatsu actually got a little worried and curtailed it back in the wake of 1977's Rape 13th Hour. Mm, okay. Apparently that one was a little too extreme. Too far, huh? And they're kind of like, hey, we got to dial it back, let it sit for a few years before we, we go back that way. <laughs> <laughs> so Jason, let us, let us discuss this, this wonderful one hour long film. It's actually an hour and seven minutes long, but yes, let's discuss. Which, that's another aspect of these, is that many of them were just an hour. I appreciate that. Um, and it's kind of surprising how much story you can actually tell in an hour if you Yeah, if you're, an, if you're it, an efficient yeah. director and you just cut out all of the fluff. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you can tell a really good story. Then. There's no reason movies need to be so long. I found it, I found it refreshing. I'd seen this before, but just re-experiencing it again and the beats mm-hmm. of everything, I was like, wow. Yeah, I agree. So we open at a train station. Mm-hmm. It's at night. It's uh, I think it's Takahata Fudo Station. 
and we were seeing people milling about, getting off the train, blah, 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 but we're focused on a woman. She gets off, she's kind of wandering around, looks like she's kind of just cutting, you know, across this street, across that street, presumably making her way home, right? Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then there's a car nearby. Yep. And this is where we get our first um, Giallo-esque moment, I would yes, say. Yes, yeah. because he's wearing gloves, like black yep. gloves. We see a dude, he raises his hand, and he stretches the black gloves over. And immediately we know we're in for some for some nastiness. It, we don't know it's not Dario Argento <laughs> driving this car. We do not. It could be. Although I don't think his musical tastes line up with this guy's. Because he puts in a cassette, and it's like this kind of like classical piano yeah. music. A little really odd, but kind of haunting, but yeah, interesting. Um, he's also got some weird style choices because he has the weird like open sandals, right? That he's wearing as well, which is how we recognize him later mm-hmm. on. Um, and he just fucking runs this girl over. He straight up, straight yeah. up just hits her. Yep, full on. And yeah, she's all limp and everything, and he he takes her into his car and he's like tying her up to the steering wheel and all this stuff. He goes full tilt, man. Like he tapes her legs down. He gets out a knife, cuts off her panties, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and has her like rigged up inside the car. Yeah. And, and then it gets, I'm going to say, exceedingly awkward. <laughs> I think that's a good term to use. He gets out like, I, I guess it's lube, right? It's, yeah, it's like lotion. It's sure, yeah. Lotion. And he just starts like rubbing lotion on her in weird on, places. With his gloved hands, With too. the gloved hand. Um, Which then leads up into him producing a... Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A dildo. A, a oddly shaped mm-hmm. black dildo, which he also lubes up. Yes. And... Uh, Man, this is going to be awkward to do these episodes. I didn't think of the logistics. I don't know if we need to go too much in detail. Um, I mean, because... Perversion and Although, honestly, this is probably the most explicit of them. I would say so, yeah. But also, it's also important important to note that it's not... I mean, it sounds pornographic, but it's not that explicit. Because you don't right. see... There's no insertion shots or anything like well, that. Yeah, I guess the one thing we should I should have glossed over in that background is that the censorship laws were is you couldn't depict any sort of genital... Right. Anything right. in a film. So throughout this movie and pretty much all the movies of the era, either it's just blocked in a way where you don't see anything. Mm-hmm. Or they frame the shot a certain style. Or, or they use the annoying digital fogging, which mm-hmm. I think came out la- later than this. That was really when they got into adult video, because that's the other weird thing when you get into the whole like history of that, is that e- even today, right now, if you went to go watch a, a Japanese porno, yeah, the genitals are pixelated yeah, out. Right. They're legally not allowed to show them at all. It's just... Outra- it's so weird. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's some sort of a cultural taboo, some hang up or something. Mm-hmm. But that also helped them produce. Since they couldn't show that directly, mm-hmm. it led them to produce some of the strangest, most fucked up stuff in the world. Right. Because you had to get the titillation somewhere else in a yeah. way, almost. Yeah. Um. And so that's kind of where this whole like zoom up series comes from, is because their premise for this is that we're going to zoom the camera in during the action as much as possible, mm-hmm. and it's. It's as close as we can get to showing you right. without showing you. Was kind of how they swung it yeah. as a pitch. Yeah. Yeah. So the guy has his way with her and drags her out of the car. Mm-hmm. And he takes her to the titular rape site. Yes. Which is a gnarly looking abandoned building that's kind of in the middle of a little suburban district. Right. Right. And um, he finds a light bulb on the ground and yep. does what you think he's going to do with it. Mm-hmm. And, and this is where, if we want to talk about these films, do have a bit of a misogynistic streak to them. <laughs> no, um, really? <laughs> yeah. Um, because not only does he shove it up in there, but then he, like, stomps on her stomach. Stomps on her. That's how he it's kills her. It's pretty yeah. brutal. It is brutal. It's very brutal. Yeah. Uh, and that's easily the most brutal thing in the movie. Mm-hmm. Easily. If if you can stick on past that part, you're, you're probably good for the rest of the film. <laughs> right. <laughs> And I mean, we, we've seen worse since then, obviously, mm-hmm. in other movies. Oh, yeah, for like sure. That. For sure. But, I mean, it's still, it's effective, you know? And it's interesting, too, because he kills her, and then he kind of just leaves, and then it, like, smash cuts to the title, and we get some, like, free y jazz. Yeah. Which, again, an inflatable sex doll, they also had a, a jazzy score. Yeah, so. I like their jazz. So then we cut to a uh, girl being tutored. A yep, young girl named Yoshimi. Mm-hmm. And there's a there's a young man, we assume probably like a college age dude, he's tutoring her. And um We learn his name is Kentaro. Kentaro, right? yes. It Which, takes a while to get his name. It does take yeah. a while. But I love that name. That is like a cool classic Japanese name, Kentaro. I don't know. There's just something about it. It's a great name. Cool. I learned something new about you today. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then they're kind of interrupted by the mother in this situation, Tomoko. Mm-hmm. 
Tomoko. She is played by Arena Miyai. Yes. And uh, this tutor obviously has the hots for her. Oh, yeah. The, the, immediately, the tension between them is very dramatic and very obvious. And, mm-hmm. and to get it in there, Kentaro, he is played by Kenji Shimizu. Okay, yes. Um, so he's kind of coming on. The dollar has left the room at this point. Yep. She's, she's frustrated because she's not doing good with her studies. Yeah. And she goes to take a break. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they stay in her room. <laughs> it makes me think of the uh, Bill and Ted moment. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Very true. Um, but yeah, she's like rebuffing his advances, so he gets all hurt and everything. And he's like, well, I've got to leave. You know, I have to get going to get to the station. It's weird because it gets almost kind of rapey because he's very forceful to her. Yeah. But also she's sort of playing into it because she's like, no, I'll scream. Right. <laughs> yeah. You, you get the impression she's not completely against this idea. Mm-hmm. But he's like, well, I'll go, she's, I'll go with you. I'll see you there. Mm-hmm. And on the way, they pass by, again, the titular... Rape mm-hmm. site. Yes. <laughs> Which they decide to hang out at. And they, we get a little context about this, too, because she's like, oh, you know, you've heard the stories, right? Mm-hmm. There's this um, serial rapist slash murderer that's in the area, and apparently he's been dumping bodies here. Yes. And and then immediately he's like, let's go in. <laughs> yeah, but recounting the story, she's obviously turned on by it. Yeah. It's a, a subtle but notable detail. Mm-hmm. And then as, as they're exploring inside, too, she's talking about, like, the logistics of this. And she's like, yeah, apparently he shoved a light bulb up in her and he squished yeah. her stomach. And she's and like, could you imagine? Could you imagine yeah. what it was like? And, and he's just like, whatever, let's go. <laughs> yeah, let's just do it already. <laughs> Which they do. Which they do, yes. Um, um, and while, after they finish, we see a car pulling in. We outside. should say, this is the sex scene, the first one in the film, where we actually get the, the, the namesake of the series... Because we get a lot of weird zoom-ins and close-ups yeah, on them getting right, it on. Right. Which, I don't, I don't know how effective it is, but... It, well, the whole movie <laughs> actually has kind of an almost um, documentarian-type feel. Mm, it's that's, kind of, it's that's kind a good of, comparison. It's kind of cinema verite, I think. Kind of puts you there with them like you're a voyeur. Yeah. Interesting. Mm. I hadn't considered that. Mm. That's the impression I got. Mm. Okay. Maybe I'm just a pervert. We'll I don't a, know. We'll go upstairs and put a gold star in your fridge, man. Woohoo! Nice. Um, but yeah, they... they um, well, I, I know we're not going to go into detail on this, but that, <laughs> I, listen, i got to talk about this one part. I think it was fucking hilarious when he just like starts motorboating her <laughs> when she gets her top off. Right, right. It's like... Sure. It was, it was just fucking ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so they're done and kind of talking, and this car is pulled up outside. Mm-hmm. And they get nervous because they're like, what if this is the killer? Yeah, but he says he doesn't... Uh, he, oh, and Kentaro's also talking about how he doesn't care about teaching Yoshimi. Yeah. He only wants to see <laughs> Tomoko. Yeah, it's just an excuse to come over and see her. And she, she asks him to rape her. Yep. Um, but they hear the people coming in from outside, and it's another cheating couple. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it's the uh, the manager of a local grocery store. We find out later. And one of his employees. Yes. And we're not sure about... At this moment, we're not sure about their arrangement. I thought maybe she was a call girl or something like mm-hmm. that. Um, yeah, some of that's context we get later on. Yeah. But just for ease of but story. She's obviously much younger than he is. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're starting going at it, and he's... Uh, manipulating her. <laughs> There's this yeah. funny line about how she needs to cut his fingernails. Yeah. And... Okay, so then he just like bites down in his fingernails and like spits out the clippings. And the sound effect for this, this is more horrifying than anything I've seen so far in this movie. Oh, wow. Because it, it was bothered just, you that much? It did. Hmm. It really did. It's the thought of like being able to bite on your nails <laughs> and make that crunchy sound. Well, speaking of biting, another weird moment in this is that when they're starting to undress, he like fucking gnaws on her panties to try to get them off. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to do it. I was like, dude, calm down. <laughs> but everything is very hyper. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it, it, and I kind of like that about it, too. It, yeah. it gives it an interesting pacing to everything. Right. Um, um, but we learn that uh, his girl, she's a little wild herself. Yeah. Because she's not really into it, and she says, you know what? I need you to choke me. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I mean, is a thing. Yeah. But they make a, criti- they make a critical mistake in this moment, which I guess we should put into the episode, which is that... If you're going in this direction, always have a safe word. <laughs> right, right. Be careful not to choke your partner too hard <laughs> to the point where they actually die. 
Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, Kentaro and Tomoko, they become voyeurs in this situation because yep, they're, they're hiding, hidden they're behind hiding one of the walls everything. and they yep. see it all. So we're kind of like watching them, watching him. And the girl's name was Fumio. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's yeah. already dead at this point. And he's like, he's like asking him to, her to marry him. Yeah, he's like, marry me. Let's go away on a vacation. Oh, <laughs> She's not moving. But yeah, he chokes her out. <laughs> and he realizes that she's dead. And he loses his shit. Yeah. Like, what are you going to do? As you would. He's looking around, freaking out. And he finds this kind of open pit. They're kind of a few levels up, mm-hmm. a few stories up in this old abandoned building. And there's this like open pit. I now, don't know. Maybe I, Yeah, I want to ask you some context here. Like, why does this pit exist? Like, why is it there? What To what purpose would you have that in a building? I'm thinking it, it, maybe it was an old elevator shaft or something. Mm. Okay, yeah, yeah, I could see that. Yeah. yeah. And they took the elevator out when right. it got condemned. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That's what I think. There is that little, like, grating, like, wire stuff in front of it, mm-hmm. too. So, yeah, I could see that. It could even been, like, a freight elevator. So, mm. there may not have even been, like, a box. It could have yeah. just been the platform. Okay. I like it. Cool. Uh, so, he's like, oh, this is a good spot. But there's already a body down there. <laughs> there's already an <laughs> occupant, yeah. There's, it doesn't seem to phase him too much. Um, and he drops Fumio down. And so another Giallo element here is now we've got our first sort of like, is this the killer? Right. Right? Because they immediately jump to that because the dude showed up. He brought a girl. He got it on with her. He killed her. But it's also, it's also kind of obvious that he didn't mean to kill her. Yeah. You know, whereas the other guy we saw definitely meant mm-hmm. to kill the girl. But unfortunately, Tomoko does not have that context. No. They think that he is the killer. And the most hilarious thing is as we see the fallout of this and um, he goes back outside and gets in the car and drives off, he came in the fucking store vehicle. It's got the logo of the grocery store right, on yeah. the back window. Not too smart. <laughs> um, but immediately Tomoko is scared because she thinks, she's like, I don't know. I think when he was leaving, I thought he saw us yeah, for right, a second. Right. Um, but they it's inconclusive and so they decide to go their separate ways. And then we get to meet uh, Tomoko's husband. Yes, Ukai. And, Played uh, by Tatsuya Hamaguchi. They have kind of a cold relationship. Very cold. And we find out, he says that he married her just to get along with his daughter. And yep. she is his former secretary. Yep, he's sort of a businessman, CEO type. Um, and she was his secretary, and I guess... It implied that... Um, fuck, I forgot the name of the daughter. Yoshimi? Yep. Um, it's implied that Yoshimi is not her kid, right. but it's the daughter from a prior marriage. So he sort of hopped out for the mistress. Yeah. And she doesn't, Yoshimi doesn't even like Tomoko. Mm-hmm. And we learned that he wasn't supposed to be home. He was supposed to be on a flight to go on some business meeting, but it got canceled. Mm-hmm. So surprise, he's home. So she's a little freaked out, obviously. And we get a little bit of their relationship, which again, you're right. It's very cold, very, very like transactional seeming. Right. Um, and he, he, all he seems to care about is that she's there, that she's a good wife. Taking care of the house. And that his kid likes her. Mm-hmm. And he even asks her, like, point blank, do you hate Yoshimi? Mm-hmm. Do you not like her? It's awkward. Yeah, it is. But then meanwhile, we catch up with uh, Kentaro. And what's he doing? He's Te- having sex with another woman. Turns out he's got a girl back home. Because he's a stud. And uh, the girl he is with, her name is... Maya Kawasaki. Maya, that's it. Played yeah, by Maya. Yuki Yoshizawa. And she's very cute. Yeah, she is. Um, and she's even teasing him about the, the stepmother mm-hmm. of the girl that he's tutoring. Yeah, she's very, like, free-spirited in a way. Like, yeah. she doesn't even... She kind of is mad, but she's not, like... It's right. not it's not relationship ending for her. She doesn't take it seriously. Mm-hmm. And we learn that, you know, they're just kind of, like, broke 20-somethings trying to get by. And mm-hmm. they're dreaming of all these vacations they could go on if they just had some money. Right. And interestingly, when they're fooling around, he goes to choke her. Mm-hmm. And she calls him a pervert and throws him off of her. <laughs> so he's kind of wanting to reenact what he saw earlier. Yeah, it made him curious, I guess. Uh-huh. And then, I like how it does this. It like cycles through all the characters. So then we cut to the manager. Yes. And he can't sleep. He is like fucking disturbed yep. in the wake of what happened. He's playing his music really loud and drinking... I couldn't find credits on what this song is, but dude, I love this song. Yeah, it's kind of a cool I song. I wish I could it's, figure out what the band was. It's almost was. like a proggy yeah. Uh, yeah, rock song. It's really cool. Yeah. And as this is going on, um, one of his neighbors comes and yells at him, asks him to turn it down, and then he goes into this crazy like dream nightmare <laughs> yeah. scenario. It's nuts, man. Where he imagines the ghost of Fumio comes back 
and strangles him. And chokes him out and kills him. Then he's like in some sort of a meat cave or something. Mm-hmm. It was very, um, I'm going to say womb-like. Yeah, very vaginal. Because yeah. there's like the, the entrance area is very like vaginally shaped. Yeah, right. And so this is one of these moments. I wanted to like highlight this scene in particular because when we're talking about the directors had all this freedom and could get creative. If you're just making this just to titillate people, there's no reason to have this scene in no, here. No, This is totally just him playing around and all the, all the cast, all the crew making some weird, yeah. trippy scene. I, I mean, he's actually getting inside this character's heads, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, the next morning, Tomoko imagines seeing a picture of her and uh, Kentaro. Like there's a there's a picture of the killer who who she thinks is the killer of the, mm-hmm. the manager, and there's and she thinks that it's a picture of her and Kentaro watching him. Yep. When he was disposing of the body and everything. And we should say the context for this too is this very very dull like family breakfast. Oh yeah. Where you can just tell like this family is like barely functional. Yeah. She's completely checked out because she's obsessed about this killer now. Mm-hmm. Ignoring Ushimi. And then the daughter doesn't care because she hates her. And mm-hmm. then Ukai just kind of wants everything to work but doesn't want to put any of the effort in. Mm-hmm. So the first chance she gets to be alone, she runs and calls Kentaro. Yep. And again, he's like hooking up with Maya. It's that funny scene too because you just see them under the covers. Yeah. You see a lump. And you the phone's ringing and you think it's going to be like Kentaro's head. But the covers come off and it's her ass. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, she she calls and she just says like, "Hey, I, I really think he saw us. I, we need to do something about this. I, I'm worried he's going to come after us." Okay, but you're not going to skip across the phone cozy she has on her receiver, are you? Oh, okay. What is it? It was like this knitted, like cozy <laughs> that fit over the receiver. <laughs> And it was like multicolored and very, very 70s. Was that just a thing? Maybe or... it was in Japan. I've know. never seen one Yeah, here. I've never seen that before. <laughs> I don't know. It was very distracting. If you have any context on that, write in. <laughs> Let us know. Um, but yeah, he kind of just brushes her off and hangs up. And is like, just, you're overreacting. Yeah. Boom. And so she kind of just tries to go about her day. Yep. She goes shopping. Shopping at the local grocery store. Where she sees... Our killer. Yep. And uh, there's another girl talking to this guy who's obviously the manager. And this is where we get the context that yeah. the woman he killed was one of his uh, employees. Yeah, because this other worker says that Fumio hasn't shown up again. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the manager's all... I don't think we ever get a name for him, do we? <sighs> we might, but it's like way, way late in the film. I can't... I don't think we do. Maybe we never do. Let's I call know. him the manager. I, I just called him the manager in my notes. Yeah. So, so he's obviously looking like, oh, shoot, you know... So he's leaving the store. Because he wants to go back to the site right. to check things out. Yeah. And he looks down the pit and the body bodies are still there. Mm-hmm. So we don't know if he's going back to make sure it hasn't been discovered or if he's going back to maybe he's kind of into it now. Mm-hmm. Reliving what happened. and It, it might be guilt. It might be uh, budding desires. Well, it might be a mixture of everything. Uh-huh. But they have a little moment where like he kind of looks in her direction... And then she looks in his before he heads out. Right. And and that just, again, accelerates her paranoia. Yeah. And this is where we really get that, like, thriller angle, I think, in the film. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she witnessed a murder. She thinks he's the killer. Thinks yeah. he knows. It's almost Hitchcockian, really. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, we get a little bit more of Kentaro tutoring. Um, mm-hmm. Fuck, I cannot remember the name of the Yoshimi. Dog. We get a little bit of Kentaro tutoring Yoshimi a little bit more. And Tomoko actually kind of forces a break. <laughs> so that she can talk to him. Uh-huh. And, and yeah, she lays it all out again. She's like, he saw me. I could tell in his eyes. He knew that we were there. Yeah, and they're both laying on the bed, like, very intimately. <laughs> and Yoshimi comes back in, and she's just like, <laughs> you could tell she knows, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is just definitely not winning her any points on yeah. the, the mama word there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Kintaro's conclusion is just like, well, let's just go to the cops. Let's tell them if it is him, they'll sort it out. Let's just not even risk it. Why would we bother? But she's not positive that he's the killer. But she's not positive, and there's one other problem. If it is the killer, it's going to be in the news. They're going to need the story. Yeah. They're going to have to go to the police and tell them what they were both doing there. And she can't lose everything. Yep. She's kind of just like hooked herself to Ukai for her existence at this point. There's no real exit strategy for her, so... No. Classic, um, I guess, erotic plot... She wants to maintain the affair, 
more than she wants to uh, deal with the killer. Right. So they go to the store, mm-hmm. and they're driving by him, um, and he's outside like sweeping or something. I don't, I don't yeah, just. Sure. It's funny because he's the manager, but he does a lot of manual labor yeah, around yeah. the store. Everybody's got to pitch in. He has a good work ethic. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, everybody's got their, their benefits and their flaws, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, her car starts acting up and... Yeah, like stalls out. Yeah. They're trying to leave. Well, he's looking directly at them before they drive away again. <laughs> and Kentaro says, yeah, that's him, no doubt. Mm-hmm. And now he saw them there kind of spying on him. So Kentaro's like, look, you don't have to get involved. I'll go to the cops. Yeah. I'll tell them. I'll say that I saw them. Right. No one will ever know you're involved. Boom, it's resolved. Mm-hmm. And she still doesn't want him to because she thinks that, you know, it's the police. Yeah. Somehow they'll find out. Right. You're, no matter how good you make the story, they'll pick it apart. And I can't get caught. Yep. And later that night, Tomoko's husband... He's typing up some stuff on his typewriter, but he doesn't want to. So he makes his wife do it. (laughs) Well, she was his secretary. Right, yeah. (laughs) And he's like, type this up for me. And you know, this is intercut, too, with what's going on with Kentaro, which he's getting like a soapy body rub. (laughs) Right, yeah. (laughs) Doing this very erotic (laughs) massage thing. It's just funny. They have such a a, fun relationship. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so the husband's just like watching her type. Yeah, he's like, so here, type this. Apparently it does it for him, because then he's like, tells her to come to bed. Mm-hmm. And she's like, no, you said I had to finish it by morning. Because she <laughs> is totally not into him, I guess, either. So He says something to her like, lately she's becoming a good wife and could do better with more effort. Mm-hmm. I just thought that line was funny. <laughs> 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 I might try that on my wife sometimes. See how you know, as, as bad as some of the other scenes are as far as like the misogyny elements, mm-hmm. something about that line, man, I was just like, oof. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so it's a, it's a tale as old as time. He gets her to the bed. He wants to have sex. And she feigns being tired. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> oh, I'll see myself out. Bye, guys. Yep. <sighs> no, but, but for real. Yeah, that, that is what happens. And very reluctantly, she goes to bed with him. Mm-hmm. And, and, and they, they hook up, but it's like... I think what you're supposed to take away from this is that he's a very selfish lover. Yeah. He's, he's not focused on... Right. It's all about his gratification. Pleasing her at all. It's all his gratification. Yeah. Uh, and then as soon as he gets off, he's done, and that's right. it. And then whatever, I'm done with you. Mm-hmm. He, he it, it very much stops short of him just telling her to go back and type. Yeah, <laughs> I'm surprised he <laughs> didn't. Uh, meanwhile, go back and going back to Kintaro, he's seeing a program on the television about the murder. Yeah, there's another body found, right? Yep. It seems that the actual killer is still doing his thing. Mm-hmm. And this is where he sort of tells Maya everything that's been going on. Yeah. And then she comes up with a little idea, which is that if you don't want to tell the cops and fix it, we should just do a little blackmail. And then we can get some money. Mm -hmm. And then we can go on that trip we want to do. But she's also curious, so she says, well, let's go check out the rape site. Right. (laughs) So they, they, you know, hop on their little bike and head over there. Meanwhile, Mr. Manager... Uh-huh. He also happens to be there, too. Yes, he does. His compulsion is growing. He decided he needed to check back in again. However, while he's he there, the actual killer rolls up. Yeah, he hears a girl scream, and he, he hides. And this girl's being pursued by a man wearing the sandals. We saw mm-hmm. him before. Yeah, and that's our clue in that this is the killer. Yep. Um. Also, ooh, her dress. That red dress. Ooh. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, but we get the usual setup. He he chokes her out. Then he gets very into like brutalizing her. Mm-hmm. Um, and we get a little bit more of like the context of this killer because there's a line he states where he says, "I'll take your dirty body and cleanse it." Yeah. So there's some sort of weird, uh, I guess, like moralistic repressed right. sexuality thing going on. Which again, Giallo. That's such a oh, Giallo killer gi- yeah. motif. Absolutely. Um. So he gets a funnel. <laughs> he gets some <sighs> acid. And uh, do we even need to describe it past that? He no. he, he puts he, the acid where you think it's going to go. Right. And again, it sounds way more graphic than it is mm-hmm. portrayed because you don't actually see it. Mm-hmm. You know, but you it's know what's happening. It's all the editing and the composition of right. everything. It's maybe it's worse that way because you're imagining everything. And so when the killer's done, he's just like, fuck it, I'm done. And he leaves her body there mm-hmm. and bounces. And the manager kind of creeps out and is just here's this 
dead body now before him. <laughs> yeah. And he comes up with the idea that he's going to throw her down the pit. Mm-hmm. So that... Um, Fumio can have a friend. Yeah, have a friend. <laughs> Here you go. You guys don't have to be alone. You could be together in the pit. So now there's three bodies down there. However, as he's doing this, Kentaro and Maya roll up, mm-hmm. which only serves to further Tomoko's theory that he is the killer. Yes. And so with that, that's uh, that's like all the proof he needs, right? He knows now yeah. this guy's the killer. It looks pretty suspicious. So blackmail is on. Yep. <laughs> and he calls Tomoko to tell her that he's going to the cops. Yep. He says, I can't take it. Uh, I'm worried. I went back. I saw that he had killed someone else. Mm-hmm. I'm going to the cops. Yep. Done deal. But the manager shows up at Tomoko's house. Mm-hmm. Well, she does. Well, she does. To finish that convo, she tries to dissuade him. She says, "Wait. Yeah. Uh, let's meet up in person. Let's talk this through first. Right. She's hoping, of course, she can change his mind. However, I guess the manager's mind has been turning mm-hmm. on this whole situation. Yeah. And he decides, you know what? That lady that keeps staring at me. I need to go figure out why she's stalking me. Yeah. So yeah, he shows up at her house. Yep, want to know why you're following me. And she immediately flips the fuck out, like, way more... Like, she goes immediately to, like, the 100 level, like, this is the killer, he's coming to kill me. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. just makes him more thrown off, because then he's like, why is this woman so afraid right. of me suddenly? Yeah, she says something about, like, don't kill me like that other girl. So he realizes that she does know mm-hmm. everything, and he starts to strangle her. It's a really, it's a really interesting misunderstanding in a lot of right. ways. Right, yeah. But yeah, he starts to try to choke her out, and then... But uh, she's kind of into it. <laughs> she's kind of into it. And... Um, they start going at then it. Then he realizes, you know what? I'm kind of into this, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and this is where... <laughs> I made this joke before we started recording that we learned that Tomoko has these problems, and the only thing she needed to fix it was some butt stuff. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> apparently this really uh-huh. does it for her. Yeah. It, yeah. <gasps> Everybody's got their uh, yeah, trigger. Um, but after they're done, he says that he'll tell her husband if she goes to the cops. Mm. So that's kind of his assurance to keep her silent. And you know, again, we're not going to go play by play, but I didn't want to talk about one moment during this sex scene. Um, <laughs> she gives him a blowjob at one point mm-hmm. and they do an interesting framing thing where they use like, he has like a button up shirt yeah. and they use like it being kind of flapped out a little bit to hide yeah. the yeah. act. Right. So that's like trademark. Like, yeah, it's all blocked yeah. really well, you know? Um, meanwhile, we go back to Kentaro and Maya, and she's sort of figured out the whole plan of how this blackmail thing's going to work. Mm-hmm. And um, her idea is they're going to do it, they're going to get the money, they're going to tell the cops and then go on the trip. So that not only do they get everything they want, but Tomoko does get screwed over in the end anyways. Right. Um, so we cut to later in the day, Tomoko sees Ukai off. He's going out for whatever it is he does. We never really know other than he's a businessman. Business. Um, and he's taking Yoshimi to stay with her grandma, I think. Yeah. There's a little context about that, that she keeps staying at the grandma a lot because she hates being around Tomoko. Right. And then it, the second that he's gone, <laughs> she's out to go see Kentaro. Yes. And Kentaro wants 7,000 yen from her. Mm-hmm. And he First he go- wants 5,000, and then he increases it to yeah, 7. Right. So he goes to take a leak, and she gets one of his ties. Mm-hmm. Tucks that away. And she tells him to come to uh, her house later, and she'll give him her credit card. Oh, and you know this scene, too? She's wearing this like black dress with these white polka dots. Mm-hmm. This is the moment where I was like, whoa, this Arena Miyai, she's really beautiful. I can see why she became like a leading lady yeah. in a lot of these films. Mm-hmm. And she's good. I mean, all the, everyone's really good in the movie. And in this back and forth exchange, this is where she lays down the whole thing of that if if they got divorced because of this scandal, it would ruin her. Mm-hmm. And she's pretty sure that Ukai would lose his job over it too. Right. So it would just no completely one wins. destroy everyone. Yeah. There's no exit. Um, I really like this visual of them driving through the rain. Yeah. It was very atmospheric and very, to be such a fast film and like moving and always going, this was like a nice slower moment. Mm-hmm. Um, but she convinces him to, well, she pulls over and then she's like, you know what? I just want to do it one last time. Yeah. Yeah. We, I'll give you the money. It will be done. Yeah. And he hesitates for like a second cause he's a guy mm-hmm. and, and men are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, Hey, you're not going to sleep with me and get out of the money. And she's like, it's not about the money. You, you're getting the money. Yeah. I just want to bone one more time. I just want it one more time. Mm-hmm. So I was like, of course you do. Let's do it. <laughs> 
And so this is where we need to go back to uh, a recent episode. Think with your brain. Always think with your brain. Yeah. Yeah. Open your eyes, right? <laughs> yeah. Important life cool. lessons here at Genre Exposure. Yep. Um, yeah, so they're hooking up again. It's intercut with Maya at the apartment, which I think is interesting because she's kind of just sitting around bored. But then it's like as as she draws out the tie, she starts to choke him out. And it's almost like Maya can sense yeah. that something is wrong. She right. just implicitly knows. Some sort of psychic connection or something. Mm-hmm. Um, somehow Tomoko gets Kentaro's body up that old building. Yeah. I don't know how. <laughs> I mean, she drove there. We get that right. But yeah. then to drag it up all those floors. Right, right. And we've already established there's no elevator. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. But you know what? Where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah, determination. Gets him up there, dumps him down the pit. And wouldn't you know it? The manager's there. Good old Mr. Manager is there. Yep. They toss the body down the pit, and they get turned on doing it and start having sex again. Mm. And they kind of get artistic with this one, too, because there's, like, a storm going on now. The rain has escalated into a full-on thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. And, like, as they're getting more into it, the thunder and lightning is, like, growing and building more and more. So it's, like, very very atmospheric in a way. Mm Mm-hmm. And they say something how, like, they're going to get along just fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they have a nice little arrangement going now. Yeah. And it's, it's clear they're just going to keep all along this path. Uh, Maya, meanwhile, she's waited all this time. Mm-hmm. Kentaro's never returned. Yep. It wasn't just a weird fear. She, she's for sure yeah. that something's happened. Right. So she writes and leaves a note for the apartment manager that is, you know, flat out. Kentaro was murdered by Tomoko. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go find the proof. Yep. So that there'll be justice for this. Yep. And she's riding on her bike. It's raining. Um, and we see a man in a car wearing mm-hmm. gloves, popping his little cassette tape. That same music kicks in. Yep. And he's driving toward her. And she looks back behind her and freeze frame. Mm-hmm. Smash to the credits. Yep. Poor Maya. Yeah. <laughs> she really did get screwed, didn't she? <laughs> at least we didn't have to see her horrible death, right? Yeah. I guess that's that's one thing at least. Um, very abrupt ending, which is another thing you'll find with a lot of these Roman pornos and many pink films too. That I like it though. You told they, the story, yeah. it's done. Get the fuck out. You know? They've hit their runtime. They've hit all their criteria. They reach the end. They're done. It's like Boom. movies in the thirties and forties. Mm-hmm. Done. Okay. Yep. The bad guy's dead. It's over. <laughs> what are you sitting around for? We don't need any other context. It's <laughs> yeah. all it's all laid out. So, I have a few notes. There's not a lot of notes floating around out here. Right. Um, and surprisingly, I combed through behind the pink curtain, and there's not an entry or any passages that reference this film. Huh. Well, there's so many. There's so many, yeah. And this is more about, you know, pink films in general, not just Roman yeah. Porno. Yeah, try to get specific. Um, I did look through. There is an appendix. There's actually three appendixes. Appendices. Uh, appendices. There are actually three appendices in this book. Uh, one which is by director and then breaks down, like, any of their films that's ever mentioned. And so O'Hara's in here, and he has a lot of his films mentioned, because, he had, again, he's made a lot of iconic films. Um, but this one is not mentioned. So hmm, Interesting. Okay. Um, but I have a few things. So um, there's a lot of mainstays in the cast and crew that are involved in other Roman pornos. Again, O'Hara, he's, like, one of their main directors. It's in a ton of infamous and, like, really well-known ones. Probably the one we should mention is uh, Fairy in a Cage from 1977. That's really well known, and that also has a Blu-ray release over here that you can get at. Hmm. Um, our lead lady, Arena Miyai, she's been in a ton, and she was actually also in Fairy in a Cage. Okay. Um, she's also the lead in the kind of pseudo-sequel to this film, titled Zoom In Sex Apartments. Oh. More on that in a minute, because I do want to talk about that a little bit. Okay. Uh, and she's also the leading lady in Love Hunter which is one that some people know because it's kind of a weird, like, Pinku-style riff on Suspiria. Hmm, interesting. It's got a whole, like, dance school thing, and there's some weird surrealist elements to it. Hmm. Um, let's see. The film critics Thomas and Yuko Mihara Weiser. I mentioned a quote from them last time to set this up. Oh, yeah. In their breakdown on this film, uh, they said that it was misogynist and mean-spirited, but they wanted to add that the project is expertly handled by the director. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, some other fun things. So I noticed on IMDb this has a 5 out of 10. I'm kind of surprised it has that rating. I would have expected it to have been much lower. But 
guess there's enough people. <laughs> you know, for a film it. like this on IMDb to get that far, I don't know. Um, so yeah, let's let's talk about this kind of sequel thing. I think that's the last key thing I want to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, so there were more zoom up films, and that was just a series. There's no connection in them. The real thing is just the camera style. That's okay. the main through line. But they did make one film that kind of picked up on this idea of the killer. Because that's another thing about this movie is the killer gets away. Mm-hmm. He's never even fucking in on anyone's radar. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's a pseudo-sequel. It's called Zoom In Sex Apartments from 1980. I say pseudo because there's no acknowledgement. There's no, you know, Tomoko. None of them come back. It's right. nothing connected. We have the same actress, but she's playing someone else. Mm-hmm. Um, and the premise of it is that we've got the same black-gloved killer... Exactly the same one, as far as we can tell. And same deal, he's going around, he's abducting women, raping them, brutally killing them. And it's all set around this apartment complex that's been, like, newly built. Um, However, it's not really about that. That's kind of the backdrop. I, I get a little bit like this one in yeah, a way. Right. Uh, and instead it goes into its own plot um, that's about, there's a woman and she's married and she's unhappy. That part's kind of the same. Mm. And then she's got like a friend from when she was in uh, college that she was really into, but they kind of drifted apart. And then he shows back up and they're kind of rekindling their relationship. But also he's kind of weird, seems a little messed up in the head a little bit. Mm. And she starts to wonder if he's the killer. Oh, okay. And it, it chains off in that same direction. Mm. Um, it's slightly infamous for one scene in it where the killer killer goes a little more brutal than even what we've seen in this film and there's a scene where he takes one of his victims and sets their genitals on fire yikes and then kind of mocks them as it burns wow what a dick (laughs) yeah nice so I think that's uh, that's that's the gist of any other fun notes I have on this one okay yeah I couldn't find anything not a lot to go on right I think even our little like talk through of the plot is more detailed than any synopsis that exists out there so for sure Okay, well, you brought the movie, so you obviously like it. Do you want to talk about mm-hmm. it first? I will. Um, and there is one more side thing I guess I should talk about. So mm-hmm. um, I keep mentioning Impulse Pictures, right? They're a side imprint of Synapse, and they're pretty much devoted to adult cinema. They have several imprints, but one of those is the Nakatsu Collection. They licensed a whole slew of these Roman pornos, and they've been releasing them at regular intervals. Um, they're very nice and collectible. They have numbered spines. Mm-hmm. So if you're like me and you buy one, you're instantly locked into getting all of them. And I've been slowly collecting them ever since. Um, most of them are on DVD. If you know anything about like the history of Synapse films, they're very on about like the quality of the work they put out. Yeah. And pretty much like I would say among all the companies, their restorations are just like the peak of top notch quality. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if there's not the materials to make a Blu-ray remaster, they won't bother with it. Right. It goes to DVD, it's done. I know, Jason, you've got, what is it, Entrails of a Virgin. Yes. That's stuck on DVD for the same reason. Right, yeah. Um, and so surprisingly, Zoom Up Rape Site is one of those where they had the materials, so it did get a Blu-ray release. Nice. Um, incidentally. Yeah, I bet those materials are hard to find. Um, I'll throw a link to their site in the show notes. This is if you're if you're interested in this or you're digging on this. Definitely you want to look for them. And I think mm-hmm. a lot of the retailers online, they also stock their stuff. I know that um, Grindhouse, and I think Diabolic too, they both had cool. some of their stuff in stock. So nice. that's a fun road and an avenue to run down. And last thing I want to mention about it is Synapse has their own podcast. It's kind of just the behind the scenes of their workings and goings on and talking mm-hmm. about the films they've licensed and stuff. That's cool. And it's very rare, but now and again they do an Impulse Pictures podcast in the same feed where they just talk about that side of the company. Okay. And I think they've only done, like, maybe, I want to say two, three episodes. Not much at all. But they're worth kind of seeking out and listening, again, if you're interested in this stuff. Or especially if you're interested in, like, Western adult cinema. Because they also break down the whole, like, 42nd Street oh, stuff nice. they got going on. Yeah, I love that stuff. Um, but it was interesting to hear them talk about the Nakatsu Collection and kind of, like, why they got into it and why they thought it was interesting stuff. And... I don't remember who said it, so I'm not going to try to attribute it to someone, but one of the things that came up in discussion is like part of their appeal to releasing these was the idea that's like, it's a intimate look at another culture and like Mm -hmm. aspects of that and things that like, this is what to the people there that made these, this was like stuff that turned them on that they thought was titillating that they thought was interesting. And it just gives you like a really interesting window into another, another culture and another point. point of view and another perspective. Yeah. 
I, I thought that was kind of compelling. It is. It's stuck in the back of my mind to share today. If you want to know a culture, look at their pornography. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, you can learn a lot in that way. <laughs> uh, so this film, this film is fucking bonkers, and I love it. It's just so ridiculous. It's so over the top. Mm. I love the pacing, man. Like, there is so much story in this film for it to just be an hour long. Yeah, there's like zero fat. It's great. And it, it never feels like they're missing anything either. They're like, no. we, get, we get to context. Yeah. We understand, like, backgrounds and motivations. And mm. it builds to a point, and it has a climax, and it ends. <laughs> oh, several climaxes, <laughs> to, be, to be honest. Um, and the reason I brought this film is I like it because I think, like, it is couched in some horror elements, some mm. thriller elements. Very slight giallo elements. Yeah. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, that's like, if you're already into that stuff, which of course we were, and I imagine a lot of our listeners are, it's kind of an easier inroad in a lot of ways to approach erotic right. cinema because yep. you've already got that context and you know that and you understand that. Mm -hmm. And you don't really have that feeling of like, well, I'm just watching people have sex in a movie. Yeah. And if you've seen a lot of the Gialli, you're already aware of the sexual violence yep. that those contain. So that's already the, in the, the mix there. The this won't shock you too much. Yeah, it won't be as quite as shocking as it yeah. could be. Um, so we, again, like if you're going to go with this film, check your feelings on it first. But mm -hmm. if you're cool with Giallo, I think you can easily make the step over here to try out these kind of films mm -hmm. and sure. go forward. Um, I don't have a lot of criticism on this film. I just really like everything about it. Mm -hmm. um, the score is not remarkable, I guess, but I mean, it's serviceable. It never pulled me out or anything. Yeah. It's not intrusive and it's not um, really, Liked the jazzy title theme, because I, I do dig jazz music. I think mm. I'm the only one here at Genre Exposure. Fucking weirdo. <laughs> um, I like the classical music that the killer uses. That's very haunting, very weird. Mm -hmm. That he's seemingly, seemingly obsessed with this song. Um, really, the only knock I can give it is that the ending is maybe a little too abrupt. But again, I think your point's very valid, Jason, that like, what else could you tell yeah. at that point? Like, what needed to be tell, told? Right. Um. And that is the formula of these films, man. Like, when you hit that hour mark, you get it done and you're done. And that's mm -hmm. it. And you just go on to the next thing. Um, and I guess, to be fair a little bit, if you're coming in for the Gialli angle, like, you're not, you're not going to get the payoffs of a Giallo mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Because it's not really about the killer. It's about Tomoko. It's about her relationship with her husband. About these interests that she has and this weird situation she's found herself in. And then her paranoia as everything ramps up. Yeah. Um, so the killer's never revealed and we never really learn more about him or his motivations or does he even get st stopped. Mm -hmm. But it's also not about that. It's about Tomoko in the end, I think. So, right. Um, I really dig it. I give this one four stars. I don't know why I hesitate for the five. I just, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, just, I don't have that compulsion to say like, this is the pinnacle for me. Right. I get it. Cool. But thoroughly enjoy it. And again, I think it's a good on ramp. If you're already down with Jalo and horror stuff. Oh, absolutely. And this is a whole new world to you. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I, I really appreciated the whole sort of Jalo almost connection. Um, yeah, it, this isn't just a sex movie. You know, it's an actual real movie. <laughs> which and that's is, the other thing, too, because if we compare this to, say, Emmanuel in Space, that's really just BS to chain between sex scenes. Sure. But here, there is a story, and the, the sex scenes support the story. Mm-hmm. And, like, build it. But, like, even... Because this was made during, the, like, the golden age of pornography in America and stuff. And even mm -hmm. then, those... They usually had stories. Yeah. You know, they were shown on film. They were... They were productions. You know, it's not like today. Yeah. You know, it's not just some girl sitting in her bedroom in front of her computer. You know, mm -hmm. they were actual productions. <laughs> um, you know, and I miss that sort of thing. I miss there actually being stories. Yeah. Um, and this is a good story. And that's what kind of makes it fun in a way. That's like, oh, you kind of have this sexy movie, but there, mm -hmm. there's still a story and there's still like a right. narrative to follow. But uh, sex is also intrinsic to the story. Mm -hmm. It's an obsessive uh, compulsion that these people have. Yep. Because I think it's true of this and also true of a lot of Giallo is you couldn't tell the story if you took that part out. Yeah. And it's, it's not like just let's take a break because we have to fuck. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like that's part of the story. Yeah. You can't have it without it. Um, so I do really dig the story. I love the whole kind of cat and mouse thing. I like the mistaken identity. Mm -hmm. Very Hitchcockian. Um, I think this could easily be remade. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, maybe, of course, if it's America, they'll cut most of the sex stuff. <laughs> but that's what makes it interesting and, and <laughs> weird and enjoyable. Right. Because it is a good story. Um, all the leads are good. Everybody's great. Yeah, just great acting all across the board. Yeah. The, the cinematography, like I said before, is very documentarian style, which I appreciate. 
uh, it puts you there. It's like you're a spectator. Mm. You're part of the movie. And I didn't consider it until you made that point, but the fact that, like, we have Tomoko being voyeuristic of the manager, mm-hmm. the manager's being voyeuristic of the killer, and then we, the viewers, are, watching are, are being voyeuristic <laughs> of all of them. Right. I like that. I like it when a movie kind of points the camera back at you in a way. You know? And that's one of those things, like, again, there's so much misogyny in this film, and it just is what it is. It's inescapable. And I don't know that they intended to do it, <laughs> but in a way, the way the film is made kind of also, like, gives a little criticism on that. In a sense, almost. Yeah. Probably accidentally, but still. I mean, you can make an argument that all cinema is misogynistic, you know, in a lot of ways. Because, I mean, <laughs> but it's also reflective of society because women, mm-hmm. unfortunately, have been the ones to bear the brunt of that abuse. Uh, and I, it doesn't celebrate it. Mm-hmm. I don't think it celebrates it. We're not no. meant to, like, feel sympathy for the killer or anything. No. Clearly, know? everything he does is meant to be horrific. Yeah. And then kind of in the end, you know, Tomoko does take agency of her situation. and Sure. And you know what? <laughs> it's okay for her to have kinky turn-ons. Sure. <laughs> you know? I'm sick of people judging others. In this day and age, especially, mm-hmm. when everything's supposed to be so, like, sex positive. Yeah. People are so fucking judgy. Like, <laughs> even the people you think wouldn't be. Mm-hmm. Like, people who are part of, you know, minorities that are, yeah. you know... It's just like it's almost like a new puritanical America. Well, for for America, sex has always been such a taboo. Yeah, it's it's so bizarre. It's so strange. Anyway, um, I don't quite get it. Hmm. But uh, the movie itself, I really dig. Yeah, I like the story. I like that it's short. I like that. It, it, I, I knew you'd appreciate that. I, I else. did, but also at the same time, I could have I could have done more. Mm-hmm. I could have done another fifteen twenty minutes, just fine. I think that's a testament to how well it's all composed in the end. Mm-hmm. That you you're in it and you dig it. Yeah, and yeah. You, everything works. If, if there's nothing missing, it fits everything in. Because how many like two and a half hour movies have you watched, and you're just like, oh god, if there had been even ten more minutes of this, right, I would just lose my fucking mind. Exactly. Even if I liked it, I'm like, ugh. It, it leaves us wanting more in a way, which mm-hmm. is that's what you want, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I love the end. I like it when he's coming up on Maya and she you and. Know. Again, to like the Giallo style, that's such a cruel ending, too. Mm-hmm. That Maya knows everything. She's trying to do what's right. Yeah, like in a conventional movie, she would be the hero. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but she gets... But she is yeah. the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> and uh, you know where she's going. She's going down that pit. Yeah, she's going to join Fumio and the others. Uh, but she'll I, be with Kentaro, I guess. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, yeah, I give it four stars, too. Nice. Yeah. Oh, Synergy. Yeah. I liked it. I'm glad you enjoyed this, man. Yeah, it's good. I was expecting something worse, mm. you know, because I'm aware of some of the... Oh, yeah, you know, it gets much worse from here. Right. Uh, and by worse, I meant more, like, brutal and everything, mm-hmm. which, you know, I can handle. It's not a big deal. Oh, yeah, considering some of the films we've already covered. <laughs> right. But you got to be in the mood for that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but no, I thought it was a really great movie. Killer, man. Yeah. Awesome. So, for our next one... Recently, what we've been doing, we've been bringing in a guest that's kind of into whatever topic we're covering. And when you know it, the number of people that are local to us that we can get a hold of and get brought in that are into this, that are into pink films, <laughs> that are excited to talk about Nakatsu Roman porno, I couldn't find anyone for mm, some reason. Hmm. How strange. So we decided to split the difference and just kind of random pick one of their most popular in the series because it's one of the standouts. Probably should talk about it anyway, so we can just cross that off. And it freed up you and me to just pick whatever we wanted cool. to go with. So nice. for next time, we actually mentioned it in this episode, we're going to be talking about 1974, directed by Masaru Konuma, the start of the Nakatsu Roman Porno s and series, Flower and Snake. Now, is this available anywhere? to stream I kind of just concluded that none of these are going to be streaming that yeah, seems to be the case no this isn't um, either it's got a DVD and a Blu-ray out from Impulse you can pick up if you want I'm sure there are certain places online you can find otherwise them. you're on your own if you want to sail the high seas I'm not going to condone that <laughs> you should go throw a little money at Synapse I think but yeah um, I and mean, this film is like fucking legendary it has to be like one of I knew about this before I had any conception of pink films or any of this stuff uh, it's uh, it's reputation precedes it mm-hmm. excellent all right, I'm looking forward to checking it out. So we'll get into all of that weirdness and see what fun ensues next time. <laughs>
<laughs> see how many people have tuned out. See if see if we even have a show left to come back to. <laughs> nice. Um, so all that said, what have you been watching? What have you been enjoying? And hey, if you're already into pink films, you happen to be listening to us, let us know some of your favorites. What one should we have checked out that we missed? Maybe we can toss it in our uh, watch list for listener episodes and cycle back for it down the road. Yeah. That would be interesting. Um, hit us up on all the social medias. We're on Facebook. We're on X. <laughs> we're on um, Instagram. Don't know about any of those other newfangled ones. Pretty good. Pretty happy with where we are. Mm-hmm. You can also reach out and contact us at genreexposure at gmail.com. We have the website, genreexposure.com. We do take comments over there. I'm mostly getting like weird spam from Russian bots about oh, God. Uh, male enhancement stuff and how I can <laughs> save a bunch of money on different things in my life. <laughs> uh, it's very tedious to delete those. Um, leave us a comment on an episode if you dug it. it. It's exciting to see them when there's a real person in there. Yeah, right. And not just more IP addresses to add to the spam filter. Yeah, so, seriously. Um, yeah, man. Wild episode. Yep. Good time. <laughs> Good time. You have been listening to Genre Exposure. Bye, everyone. Take care. listening to the prescribed films podcast network home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment the shows on this network all have a common goal providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media the pfpn hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com thanks for listening